thank you all for coming today. Please check your cell phones to make sure they're turned off. We would like the Santa Barbara, we would like to thank the Santa Barbara Central Library and CEC for co-sponsoring our forum today. We would also like to thank Jen Limberger, who has been vital to our, all of our video and computer setup for the library for us for these past couple of years. Thank you, Gary Atkins Sound System and Sylvia Uribe, Transult Linguistic Services, who's transferring, translating simultaneously. And if you need to hear this in Spanish, you can sit up next to her and hear it in Spanish. You can move up and sit next to Sylvia. This forum is being recorded by TVSB and is available on Channel 17. You look at their programming on demand and look at video, and you can see their schedule. Today, it is also being simultaneously streamed live to Facebook, to um, the League and CEC Facebook. You can later look at our website, the League of Women Voters .org, uh, League of Women Voters, LWVSantaBarbara.org, and see all our past forums. If you're interested in learning more about the League, we have a membership table at the entrance, and you can talk to the ladies there. We want to thank the committee who organized this forum today. That would include Gail Fairburn, Jean Holmes, Vijaya Jamalamadaka, Colin Jones, Rave Morin, Gil Osherencho, Linda Phillips, Cheryl Rogers, my, and myself. And for communications, Jane Benefield and Barbara Kuhn. Thank you, Suzanne Brothen and Bonnie Jensen for hospitality today. We have index cards that you may be at your seat or we will pass out and we will take questions at the end of the presentations. We will collect the index cards at the end of the presentations for that. As uh, Jen told you, we will not be having another forum until September. I have a few announcements. Um, there's one final discussion group for the League on April 26th at 11.30 at La Stella Cafe, and the topic is looking at your own carbon footprint. Earth Day is coming up. August 27th, the League will have a table in the public market. Earth Day is open 11 to 6 or 8 o'clock, I think, on Saturday, and it's open on Sunday as well. The League of Women Voters has a convention, state convention coming up May 30th through June 2nd. It will be in Pasadena, and if anyone is interested, they can actually attend for one day and drive to Pasadena, and um, you would have to register for that. You can talk to the people at the membership table if you want to find out how to do that. Our book club will be meeting in, on May 28th, and the title of the book is White Fragility. June 8th will be our annual meeting. June 15th will be our joint board meeting. And July 11th will be our calendar planning meeting. I would now like to introduce Mary Bird, who will be our moderator. She retired last year from Santa Barbara County Air Pollution Control District, where she worked on award-winning programs, including Santa Barbara Car Free and Protecting Blue Whales and Blue Skies the partnership to slow ships down in the Santa Barbara Channel for cleaner air and safer whales. She is currently on the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary Advisory Council as an alternate member. Thank you, Mary. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to engage in this community conversation about the climate change challenges we are facing and how we can face them together. Here's how this will go. We will hear first about the climate change impacts we are expecting the most in this region, 
Then we will hear about climate change and health impacts, and then we'll hear about sea level rise. So jot down your questions as they come to you, and we'll take them at the end. Sigrid Wright had a family emergency and so was unable to join us today. Our best wishes are with her and her family. We are very pleased to announce that Kathy King was able to come today and speak. Thank you, Kathy. So our first speaker is Kathy King. She's Director of Outreach and Education at the Community Environmental Council. She's been there for more than 10 years, serving in many capacities, including as festival director for this Earth Day Festival, which is April 27th and 28th, coming up, and as manager of the Ditch Plastic Program. Thanks, Kathy. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. As many of you know, CEC has been creating solutions to our region's environmental challenges for nearly 50 years. When we began, we focused on recycling, hazardous waste collection, and community gardens. As the issues have grown, we have shifted our work to focus on clean energy and transportation, healthy food systems, and reduction of single-use plastic. We are now looking more deeply into how all of these efforts integrate into a just and resilient transition to a cleaner and healthier region. So what do we mean by climate resilience? Here's a definition that we like. It's notable because it includes our social system as well as our environment. Climate resilience, the ability of our social and ecological systems to withstand and adapt to the variable and extreme weather associated with climate change. It's important that we talk about resilience in the face of the 330% increase in extreme weather catastrophes just since 1980. As these incidences increase, we must connect the dots between climate change and its consequences. We need to adapt and strengthen our communities to be more climate resilient. We also need to get past thinking about these events as one-offs because the data is sending a clear signal that they are now part of a pattern that is influenced by our changing climate. We've had some very real extreme weather examples locally. The Thomas fire impacts were huge. Two people died, a vast amount of acreage and many buildings were destroyed. Over 100,000 people were evacuated for several days. I'm sure I'm not the only one in here, maybe I am. <laughs> it was a lot. We learned what it meant to live with air quality that's usually associated with places in China and India. It was also expensive and held the title of California's largest fire, but not for very long. The Thomas fire was particularly devastating, but the pattern has been growing for a while. We've had 10 other significant fires in Santa Barbara County in the last 10 years, including one since the Thomas fire, the Holiday Fire, that destroyed 13 homes in a couple of hours with almost no notice. While the Thomas fire was still being fully contained, the January 9 debris flow occurred. This event affected many of us personally, and we are still recovering from the physical and mental effects of that event. The concern now needs not only to be how do we recover from these events, but how we get past thinking of these as singular events and address more holistically the cycles of increased heat, extended drought, and extreme precipitation. Whoops, wrong one. The state of California issued its fourth climate change assessment report last August, and for the first time, this document featured regional chapters, including one that looks specifically at the risks on the Central Coast. The state's climate change assessment report identified these six risks as, our, as for our region. Temperature, sea levels, snowpack, heavy precipitation events, drought, and wildfire. Let's take a quick look at how some of these vulnerabilities might affect the Central Coast. The first is heat. 17 out of the hottest 18 years on record have occurred since 2001. The four hottest years in human history have been the last four years. This record goes back to 1880 when we first started measuring temperatures with instruments. Whoa. I thought we took the animation out of that, sorry. 
To look at it another way, this graph shows the distribution of normal temperature ranges between 1951 and 1980. The white days are the normal days, the blue days are the cooler than average days, and the red days are the warmer than average days. You can see that they are fairly equally divided. In the 1980s, the curve starts to shift to the right, and the warmer than average days begin to dominate. You can see in the, whoops, did it again. I think these are animated more than I thought they were. Uh, you can see in the lower right-hand corner that dark red, the appearance of a new statistically significant number of extremely hot days. In the 1990s, it shifted to the right even further. Then in this century, the extremely hot days became more numerous than the cooler than average days, and the extremely hot days now cover almost 15% of the planet. More animation. <laughs> On the central coast, you might think extreme heat isn't a significant issue as we're more temperate than inland areas. But the problem is that when we do have high heat, we are not as well prepared as places that are used to hot weather. Extreme heat for us is, de is defined as 87.5 degrees, a temperature we are now seeing more often. For example, during a 2006 heat wave, coastal communities suffered higher rates of heat-related mortality as compared to inland communities. Models based on business, ex business as usual greenhouse gas emissions indicate we will more than quadruple extreme heat days on the central coast within the lifetimes of most of the people in this room. Heat is also a significant threat for our region's outdoor workers, as well as the very old, the very young, and people of color. A climate resilience discussion needs to include ways to help these communities deal with increased heat. Cooling centers, for example, may need to become as common as warming centers. One study shows that by 2100, California will need an additional 17 gigawatts of energy generation due to the impacts of higher temperatures on energy demand. This includes increased use of air conditioning. When I first moved to Santa Barbara in 1998, there was a saying that we needed air conditioning about five days a year. I think we all know that we could use it more days than that now. Even without this increased heat, Santa Barbara and Ventura counties are already dealing with lack of capacity and increased risk due to our electrical transmission lines that run through the back country, areas that are vulnerable to fire and mudslides. It is as yet unclear how our region's cyclical drought patterns will be affected by climate change. But there's a good chance that as it gets hotter, our stressed water supply will be further stressed by water demand for agriculture and landscaping. As we draw further on groundwater, the state predicts an increase in saltwater intrusion into our freshwater supplies. Warm water molecules are larger than cold water, and warm air holds more moisture. These factors are causing storms to drop more water all at once. We are still getting rain, but it is likely to come in more intense storms. This makes it a challenge to hold on to that water as this type of storm tends to charge into the ocean without recharging our groundwater. On January 9th, 2018, the hills above Montecito received a half an inch of rain in five minutes. You'll be hearing more about sea level rise later, so here are just a few quick slides to show what we may be facing. This map illustrates the severity of sea level rise locally. We need to begin taking this threat seriously and plan for the consequences of these projected extreme impacts. Terms like 100-year or 200-year floods are no longer adequate because they are based on historic data and we can no longer use the past to predict the future. There has been a fair amount of research and modeling on the connection between sea level rise and storm surges. This map shows that by 2060, we may lose one third of Santa Barbara's low-lying sandy beaches due to erosion. This may feel far down the road, but we are already dealing with coastal erosion and saltwater intrusion into freshwater systems. This combination of storm surge and sea level rise will threaten much of our critical infrastructure. Highway 101, the airport, the wastewater treatment plant, the desal plant, and the railroad line. Also threatened are public and private beachfront properties and several low-lying neighborhoods. Okay, now we can turn to hope. <laughs> we do have an opportunity to write a different story, but we have to do it now and in a way that is coordinated.
Our community has faced difficult challenges before. Two historic events in particular stand out for their ability to capture our imaginations and allow us to remake ourselves. After the 1925 earthquake in rebuilding, we created Santa Barbara's iconic architectural style. The 1969 oil spill put a spotlight on our city, catalyzed the modern environmental movement, and created local organizations like the CEC, Get Oil Out, and Environmental Defense Center that continue to do this work today. At the heart of CEC's current work is the goal to transition our energy system to renewables. We have helped over 700 homeowners go solar, successfully advocated for utility scale solar projects that are now functional, and we're working to solarize nonprofit buildings. Solar jobs are local jobs, and a solar spill is just a sunny day. <laughs> CEC worked with the Sierra Club to successfully advocate for Goleta and Santa Barbara cities to set a goal of 100% renewable electricity by 2030. Almost 80 other cities in the US have set this goal within the next 10 to 30 years. And five of those cities are on our central coast. Former Governor Brown set a goal of 5 million electric vehicles on California's roads by 2030, and Governor Newsom is continuing that push. Locally, CEC is working with fleets, governing bodies, and auto dealers. Last fall, we worked with the Sierra Club to advocate that our MTD set a goal to transition to 100% electric buses by 2030, and they agreed. We also su successfully advocated the county to agree that they will only purchase electric sedans going forward, and they are going to analyze what it will take to transition their entire fleet to EVs. They are also looking at workplace charging for their employees. 637 people have taken a test drive at one of our green car shows in the last two years. We are working in Ventura County to increase EV adoption among low-income communities. There is now a secondary market for EVs, and for the first time we will have used Nissan Leafs at our Earth Day Festival green car show, happening next weekend in Alameda Park. Since we helped create the Santa Barbara County Food Action Plan a few years ago, our food program has really taken off. We are actively working on carbon farming. It's the simple practice of adding a small layer of compost to rangeland, and the results are amazing. Better water holder holding capacity, increased grass growth, and it preserves the topsoil, all while removing carbon from the air. We have been working with the Mid-County Ranch for a couple of years and are seeing great results. We also started a program called Santa Barbara County Food Rescue, and we are partnering companies with excess prepared foods with groups in need. Two examples are that the Shumash Casino is now providing over 600 pounds of food a month to the Buellton Senior Center, and Pure Joy Catering is providing their excess food to Sarah House. This program not only feeds people, but it diverts a huge amount of food from the landfill. Our choices for how and where we get energy affects our entire regional community. Collective advocacy helped stop the development and redevelopment of power plants near Oxnard's majority population, low-income communities of color. CEC has worked with CAUSE to form a regional climate justice network. It's new, but it's gathering speed, and I'm sure you will hear more about it in the coming months. There's also activity at the broad regional level here in California. CEC is a member of this group that includes Central Coast counties from Ventura to Monterey. The mission of the Central Coast Climate Collaborative is for these six counties to work together to acknowledge climate impacts, create adaptation plans, and work to mitigate the effects as much as possible. Mitigation and adaptation, these are buzzwords that we hear a lot, so here's my definition of them. Adaptation is doing what's needed to adjust to the impacts of climate change. Mitigation is taking action to prevent further impacts, the largest of which is reducing our emissions drastically in a really short time frame. Thank you for the opportunity to share what we're doing and move this conversation forward. We believe that there are creative and innovative ways that we can all work together. It's essential that we plan and be ready. Every economic forecast about climate change says that a dollar spent today saves much more than that tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy King. Our next speaker, Dr. Linda Rudolph, is director of the Center for Climate Change and Health at the Public Health Institute. She has previously served as deputy director for chronic disease prevention and health promotion 
at the California Department of Public Health and Health Officer, Public Health Director for the City of Berkeley. Welcome, Dr. Rudolph. Hi, I'm really happy to be here. Um, went to school here, uh, was here in 1969 for the oil spill, and uh, on the radio yesterday I heard um, some quotes from the um, document that Professor Rod Nash developed at that time, and I thought, wow, was that ever prescient in terms of the situation we have now with the complete degradation of so many ecosystems and at the top of the list with climate change. So I want to talk today about um, how climate change impacts health and how climate action can really benefit health. And that's really my two messages. It's everything I want you to take away. Climate change is the greatest health challenge of this century. And um, the things that we can do to take action on climate change represent our greatest health opportunity to address the biggest other challenges that we face, which are chronic disease and health inequities. So um, I think everyone knows that we live in an industrialized world and um, what we eat, how we move around, how we get our food, um, how we heat, cool, and light our homes, how we cook our food, um, how we get our energy, those are big systems, transportation, energy, food and agriculture, and our buildings and land use that are driving greenhouse gas emissions. But those are also the systems that are really shaping the community environments in which we live. And we know now that far more than health care, it's the environments in which we live, work, learn, and play that really drive health outcomes. And we also know that those neighborhood, that community environments aren't all the same. Um, I'll come back to that. Our greenhouse gas emissions are warming the atmosphere and resulting in five key um, global climate impacts. And it's those global climate impacts that are causing the local impacts that um, Kathy talked about and those local impacts wildfires, drought, extreme precipitation, extreme heat, and sea level rise, and ocean acidification that are causing the health impacts. But those health impacts aren't equally distributed across all people. We have very significant differences in life expectancy and in the occurrence of um, the diseases that drive life expectancy, which are predominantly chronic diseases, in every community in California, sometimes differences of as much as um, 15 years of life in communities that are really just miles apart. And people that live in communities that um, are close to freeways, that have a lot of industrial air pollution, that have lots of pavement and not very many trees, that um, are um, you know, populated with fast food restaurants and liquor outlets, those are the communities that have the worst health outcomes those are also the communities that have the most impacts on their health of climate change. And partly that's from the environments, but it's also because those communities have many of the illnesses that um, make one more sensitive to additional air pollution or additional um, heat and so on. And that also make people less resilient because they may not have insurance. So what are those health impacts? Um, heat is actually the, um, the climate-related uh, extreme event that uh, kills more people than, than anything else. Um, Kathy mentioned that 650 people, um, were through 650 excess deaths in 2006 in a California heat wave. Um, but just to give you a sense of the magnitude of how heat can kill, in 2003 there was a heat wave in Europe that killed between 70 and 80,000 people. 
in just a few weeks' time. Um, people that live in urban heat islands, places with lots of pavements, not too many parks, um, lots of density, not too many trees, are more at risk, as are the very young, the very old, people with diabetes, um, some people with uh, mental illness who take drugs that may make them more sensitive to heat, pregnant women, and outdoor workers. Um, not just agricultural workers, but also landscape workers and construction workers and a host of others. Um, you can see this little fast fact that in, African, in, in Los Angeles, African Americans are uh, more than twice as likely to die in a heat wave as others in the city. Homeless people are also at, at, at high risk. Um, warming temperatures don't just cause heat illness, they also cause an increase in ozone production, which is one of the key components of smog. Um, and they also cause a rise in um, pollen production. So the pollen season is becoming longer and also um, worse. The pollen season in some parts of the country is already uh, three to four weeks longer than it normally is, and there's more pollen in the air, and that pollen is more potent. And um, the librarian mentioned um, poisonous plants. The poisonous plants like poison oak and poison ivy are also not only becoming more prolific in their growth, but the um, active chemicals that cause the rashes from those plants are becoming more potent as a result of warming. Heat is also associated with severe wildfires. Um, the air pollution uh, that's increasing as a result of this warming temperatures is associated with um, exacerbation of asthma and other respiratory illnesses and also an exacerbation of cardiovascular disease. So once again, the very young, the very old, people that have ex pre-existing um, lung disease or heart disease are at higher risk from these exacerbations of bad air quality days associated just with temperature, but also, as everyone knows, with smoke. Um, <clears throat> drought, also exacerbated by heat because it causes more evaporation, um, not only impacts access to water, and the pictures on the left show um, what the Tulare County Public Health Department had to do in the drought a couple of years ago when um, thousands of people literally had their taps run, run dry. And the county had to set up water distribution centers. They set up community showers so that people would have access to basic sanitation. But drought also concentrates um, chemicals, um, contaminants in both surface and groundwater, making it harder to treat or more dangerous to drink. Uh, drought is associated with migration. Um, there's been a very severe drought in the northern triangle of Central America that's probably one of the key contributors, amongst other things like, like violence, but a key contributor to the mass migration that we're seeing from El Salvador, Central America, and Honduras now as farmers just cannot sustain their livelihoods because of a prolonged drought. And many experts think that um, it was a very severe drought in Syria that actually drove um, a lot of the conflict and civil war there. Um, drought's also associated with an increase in mosquito-borne disease like West Nile virus and an increase in dust-borne disease like valley fever. Um, ooh, I hope I've got my wildfire slide, but I'll come back to it if I don't. I thought it was going to be there. Um, food security, drought, extreme weather, extreme heat all reduce um, crop yield. And we know that when crop yield is reduced, food prices go up, and so food insecurity is increased. We also know that rising carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere are actually reducing the protein content and the micronutrient content of many staple foods like rice, millet, and some kinds of wheat. So we're also seeing a reduction in the nutritional quality of some of the basic foods that people rely on. We waste about 40% of our food. Most of that goes into the landfill where it 
produces methane, which is a short-lived climate pollutant that's many-fold more potent in terms of global warming potential than carbon dioxide. Um, we also see more harmful algal blooms and marine toxins in shellfish um, as a result of warming ocean water. And ocean acidification is causing a reduction in our fisheries um, supply, which also impacts food security and the availability of healthy fish. Kathy mentioned extreme rain events. Um, the Montecito mudslide was a really good example of what we call a cascading or compounding event in climate change, where these things are all related. Wildfires are associated with heat and drought. After a wildfire, when the soil has been denuded, you get an extreme precipitation event and you get huge mudslides. So it's not like these things are all just happening in isolation. We're experiencing them at the same time or in sequence. Um, rainfall, extreme rainfall leads to flooding, and flooding leads to both displacement, but also it leads to waterborne disease as we get um, contamination or from toxics or contamination from sewer overflows. So almost all of the waterborne disease outbreaks in the US in the last several decades have been associated with flooding events. After floods, we have problems in houses that have been inundated with mold. I mentioned West Nile virus um, and, and valley fever in, associated, in association um, with um, drought, but we're also seeing changes in the distribution of, of um, mosquitoes um, in association with um, rising temperatures and changes in rainfall patterns. Um, so the mosquito called Aedes aegypti that carries viruses like dengue fever and chikungunya fever and Zika virus um, that we didn't used to have in California, we now have in most of the Southern California counties. I don't think it's in Santa Barbara yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's heading this way, especially to the more inland portion of the county. Um, again, people that live in, in poor housing, that don't have screening, outdoor workers, um, people that live in blighted neighborhoods where uh, mosquitoes can, um, it can uh, multiply, and the Egypti mosquito only takes about a bottle cap of water um, to breed in, are all at higher risk. Um, for flooding, for fire, um, which um, I don't have a slide on, but carries these huge, results in these huge plumes of smoke, creating very bad air quality. A big component of wildfire smoke is particulate matter that we now know is associated not just with asthma and cardiovascular disease, but also with adverse reproductive outcomes. And uh, a lot of emerging evidence suggests that it's associated with um, poor neurodevelopment in the very young and also with cognitive decline in the elderly. We used to think that these smoke days were, you know, just a couple of days here and there, but as you experienced here and as we experienced in Northern California, we're now having these really bad air quality um, uh, periods that last perhaps, you know, weeks to a month or five weeks um, as a result of, of the wildfires. So all of these events are associated with stress on mental health, displacement, the economic stress of rising food and water prices, um, the, the trauma associated with a really bad flood or a really bad fire. All these cause um, mental health impacts, particularly um, for women and children, uh, women because they're usually the caregivers that are, that are trying to figure out how to cope with their um, family stress, people at low income um, who often don't have insurance, um, undocumented immigrants, undocumented workers are not eligible for FEMA assistance. Um, they don't have the economic resources to recover. And then a new form of mental health stress called solastalgia or people's concern about what does the future hold for my home, for my landscape, for where I'm familiar with. Um, these are all important impacts. And finally, the healthcare system is at risk itself. Um, 
as you can see in the middle picture there, that's the Kaiser Permanente Hospital in Santa Rosa in the 2017 fires being evacuated with a wall of flames behind it. But extreme floods also disrupt the healthcare supply chain or the hospital. Um, many hospitals were closed after Katrina and Superstorm Sandy. They took months to get back to speed and they really reduced healthcare access for populations in those cities. So, my turn to talk about hope. Um, the good news is that um, the Lancet Commission on Climate Change and Health, Lancet being one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, said that climate change, clim confronting climate change, acting on climate change, may be the greatest health opportunity of the 21st century. Why is that? It's because to address climate change, we need to transform the same systems that are causing disease and causing climate change. So if we move away from um, burning dirty fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, we will significantly reduce air pollution. If we reduce air pollution, we won't only reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we'll also reduce respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease, adverse reproductive outcomes, um, and we'll reduce fuel poverty that's forcing people to choose whether they're gonna heat their homes or feed their kids. Um, the same thing with moving to low and zero emission fuel, fuel um, vehicles and fuel efficiency. Um, and I'll just note that our president is doing his very best to roll back the regulations to protect our air quality and to give us efficient vehicles, and we really need to be paying attention to fighting what's happening in Washington and preserve the progress that we're making in California and spread that progress to other places. The biggest bang for the buck in terms of changes in our transportation system is getting people out of their cars and using active transportation, biking, walking, and using public transit, um, which only will happen if we build our cities and communities in a way that supports safe walking, safe bicycling, and gives people convenient, affordable, and accessible public transportation. But if we can do that, since sedentary behavior contributes so much to ill health, we would significantly reduce heart disease, stroke, um, diabetes, obesity, depression, osteoporosis, some cancers, um, and we'd significantly increase um, emotional well-being. And we'd also reduce transportation costs, um, and we could improve social cohesion that we know is super important when these really bad events happen. To give you a sense of the magnitude of those impacts, if we move from just the current average of four minutes a day to 19 minutes a day in physical activity for commuting, we'd get about a 12% reduction in cardiovascular disease and diabetes. That's a huge public health impact. Similarly, one of the other big contributors to chronic illness is our poor diets. We eat way too much meat that contributes to heart disease and cancer, and also livestock production is a major cause of methane emissions. Um, so if we stopped eating so much meat, we'd reduce greenhouse gas emissions and reduce cancer and heart disease. And if we provided better access to sustainably grown fruits and vegetables, we'd also address diabetes, heart disease, um, and obesity. We've talked about heat. Um, greening our neighborhoods here in Santa Barbara proper, there's a wonderful tree canopy in lots of parks. But in North County or um, East County, not so much. Um, so if we could really improve the greening of the entire county, we wouldn't just reduce the risk for heat illness, but we'd also reduce flooding risks. We'd reduce air pollution because trees capture air pollution. Oh, I'm not gonna make that, sorry. But I'll, I'll talk faster. <laughs> I got my one minute warning. So there's been four recent studies that, big international studies that talk about climate change and health. And I just want to review them with you very quickly. There, um, I won't go through this, but 
the International Panel on Climate Change special report on global warming, which said how much more climate change we get is up to us, but there's a huge difference. Every incremental increase in climate change significantly increases the health impacts. Um, stringent mitigation efforts can prevent millions of premature deaths and alleviate poverty around the world. The Lancet Commission, current changes are an early warning of overwhelming public health impacts if temperatures keep rising. Climate change exacerbates health and social inequities. Um, if we want to meet the two degree target, we have to transform our transportation, food, agriculture, and land use systems, and that will help us address the root causes of our biggest public health challenges. The World Health Organization Special Report on Health and Climate Change. Um, climate change is the most likely highest impact global risk to society as a whole. Every delay in, 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 in action increases risks to human lives and human health. Massive benefits, massive health benefits from tackling climate change. Local authorities have the mandate and legal responsibility to protect and promote health. And we really need to pay attention to whether our local health departments have the resources and the capacity to address these issues. And I suspect that the public health department in California really needs some resources to kickstart their own action to promote and protect health in the era of climate change. So what's the message? Climate change is impacting our health now. The warmer it gets, the worse it gets. Climate actions have health benefits. We need to keep adaptation in mind because those impacts are already here. But if we don't take transformative action with great urgency, we risk truly catastrophic effects on human health and well-being. And according to the all these big reports, potentially the survival of human civilization. So climate change really is a global health emergency. We're not moving in the right direction. Um, the stakes could not be higher. And I want to read you this quote from Greta Thunberg, who's one of the young women who's leading these Fridays for Future school walkouts. She says, why should any young person be made to study for a future when no one is doing enough to save that future? What's the point of learning facts when the most important facts given by the finest scientists are ignored by our politicians? You say you love your children above all else, and yet you are stealing their future in front of their very eyes. So um, health professionals are taking action. We have. Um, a whole set of recommended priority actions for policymakers. I'm not going to go through them, but we need everyone in the community to help others understand that this is a health issue and that taking action on climate change is also a tremendous opportunity to address our great challenges and to reduce health inequities. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Rudolph. I do recommend, if you're interested, you Google the California Call to Action on Climate Change and Health. There's a lot of really good information in there about what needs to happen. Now we're going to switch gears and get into sea level rise impacts. Selena Evelsizer is a senior planner with the County of Santa Barbara's Long Range Planning Division. She is managing the county's coastal resiliency project and is working on related climate mitigation and adaptation efforts. Welcome. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Selena Evelsizer. I work for the County of Santa Barbara. I'm going to give you a brief overview of some of the regional efforts that local agencies are undertaking right now. 
um, with regard to climate change, mostly related to sea level rise because that's where a lot of the funding has been in the recent past. But um, as you'll see, there are some other climate change related initiatives going on. And then I'm gonna take a deeper dive into the county's own coastal resiliency project and explain that to you um, and give you some uh, information that we've learned from that. So like I mentioned, the county has its own coastal resiliency project, which has been looking at sea level rise and related impacts along the county's coastline. And I'll talk about that more starting on the next slide. The city of Santa Barbara has also had a several year long sea level rise vulnerability and adaptation process going on, which Melissa Hetrick will be talking about next. The Santa Barbara Airport through the city has also been looking at sea level rise related impacts to their facilities. The city of Goleta prepared a coastal hazard, hazards vulnerability and fiscal impact report, which is available on their website if you're interested. And also related, um, the Goleta Slough Management Committee released a, a report examining potential sea level rise impacts to the Goleta Slough area, and that's available online as well. The city of Carpinteria is in the middle of their sea level rise and coastal hazards process. They just released their sea level rise vulnerability assessment and adaptation project, and they're working on updating their coastal land use plan and general plan. And I know they've been um, having public workshops, so if you live in or near CARP and are interested, please go to their website. You can find out more information on participating in that. Uh, UCSB has been examining and addressing climate change vulnerabilities, both to their facilities and lands that they manage, like the Devereux Slough Restoration Project. And also, reach researchers at the university have been studying climate, science, climate change science and potential impacts. One study that I wanted to mention to you is called the Santa Barbara Area Coastal Ecosystem Vulnerability Assessment. And it uh, looked at the cities of Carpinteria, Santa Barbara, Goleta, and the unincorporated county areas in the southern county there, and looked at coastal um, ecosystem impacts from sea level rise. So it's pretty interesting. You can go online and find it or contact me afterward. I can link you to that. Then um, the Santa Barbara County Association of Governments is in the middle of their regional transportation network vulnerability assessment. So they received funding from Caltrans to look at um, our county regional uh, transportation network, not just roads, but also other transportation facilities and looking at potential impacts to those facilities from uh, sea level rise, uh, storm flooding, and wildfire. So that will be released later this year. And then finally, the Santa Ynez Band of Chumash have been undergoing a climate change transportation vulnerability assessment which will assess potential vulnerabilities from climate change to sites and resources of traditional and cultural significance to the Chumash people. So that's that's an example of things that are going on now. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me afterward and I can link you up or Google. <laughs> so I'll take a deep dive into the county's own coastal resiliency project. We started it way back in 2014. We received a couple of grants. Uh, we modeled and mapped sea level rise and associated flooding, erosion, and high tide hazards along the entire county coastline using the state's best science and guidance at the time. We then mapped assets along the unincorporated county coastline to see which facilities, lands, and other coastal uses are potentially at risk or vulnerable. After public workshops and hearings, um, policy ideas were put forth to the Board of Supervisors, and they adopted amendments to our coastal land use plan and coastal zoning ordinance this past December. They are not in full effect yet. The, co the California Coastal Commission is reviewing them through their certification process, but we hope that the policy amendments will be adopted later this year. 
So I'll give a really quick overview of the modeling and mapping phases and the vulnerability assessment process and some interesting findings. The study area, although we modeled and mapped the entire county coastline, we looked at potential vulnerabilities in the unincorporated county areas only. Um, the vulnerability assessment was prepared by mapping coastal assets in a broad range of all different types of assets along the coast, facilities, land uses, and assessing whether they fell within the coastal hazard areas that resulted from the sea level rise modeling effort. So the worst case scenario was used for each time step. We modeled different time horizons through the end of this century. And we, uh, for purposes of the vulnerability assessment, we used a situation where we looked at a 100 year storm event at high tide plus a five feet um, amount of five feet of sea level rise, which was the state's guidance at the time. And I'll give you an example of the types of coastal hazard maps that we have, and I'll show you where you can go online to find them as well. So this is uh, one example of the type of map in our vulnerability assessment document. It's a zoomed in view. And as you can see, the areas subject to potential flooding and erosion are shown in different color gradations. The blue is, are, those are areas along the coast that are subject to flooding and erosion now. And then as you get further in, those are um, areas that might be vulnerable down the road as we experience increased levels of sea level rise. So this is a static map that's in our vulnerability assessment document that's on the county's webpage. But this is the coastalresilience.org mapping tool. And it's an online interactive mapping tool you can access at home or wherever. We put all of our, um, all of the information, the shape files and model results from the sea level rise modeling process that we went through on here. So you can scroll up and down the whole county coast and look at different sea level rise scenarios, look at potential flooding or erosion or high, high tide hazard areas. So if you're curious about potential impacts to specific areas, then I highly recommend you check this out. So I'll give a sampling of the findings from our vulnerability assessment. Um, with up to five feet of sea level rise, there would, could be up to 62 miles of railroad track in the whole, in the whole county area um, at risk of flooding and erosion impacts and 45 miles of roads in the unincorporated county areas alone. We also found that 34 bus stops, 24 miles of bus routes, and 12 miles of Highway 101 are potentially vulnerable. Uh, this is a sampling of some other findings. Um, fortunately, some good news, no police or emergency medical facilities in the unincorporated county areas were found to be at risk. And only when we approach five feet of sea level rise to impacts to some um, public, other public facilities occur, but that gives us time to consider what our options are and implement plans. The Gaviota oil terminal is not projected to be impacted, and no industrial land uses were found to be vulnerable. There are few hazardous materials sites, either storage sites or underground storage tanks, work that uh, might be exposed or vulnerable. And those that are, are again, not until we approach five feet of sea level rise. So again, that gives us some time. However, over 800 acres of residential land uses are potentially vulnerable, and over 1,100 acres of county parks are um, at risk. There are also over 350 known prehistoric and 150 known historic sites along the coastline that are vulnerable with up to five feet of sea level rise. So that's definitely one area that needs further examination. The existing policies in the county's coastal land use plan were reviewed to understand where new policies may need to be added to address these risks and vulnerabilities or where we need to enhance existing policies. In the um, amendments that the board adopted this past December, there are no changes to zoning or land use designations. Um, and one of our, but one of our main goals was to end up with a process that is predictable to applicants who come in and seek permits for coastal development permits um, for coastal development projects along the coast. 
So um, kind of there are two major policy themes regarding development. Um, existing development that is inside of those sea level rise coastal hazard zones can still be repaired and maintained, but would su be subject to a 50% redevelopment threshold, meaning that up to 50% of the structure can be significantly or structurally altered without having to address coastal hazards at that site. But if a, an existing building is substantially altered more than 50%, then it's treated, it's considered to be a new building. And then those alterations would have to take into consideration what needs to be done to protect occupants of that building for the, the rest of the life, the useful life of that building. And similarly, brand new development in the coastal zone would be designed to avoid coastal hazards for the life of that development as well. So these are just a couple of the next steps that the county as an entity is taking. We're um, starting the process to update the safety element of our general plan to address climate change related hazards, not just sea level rise, but other, other climate change related hazards along the unincorporated county areas. Also, later this year, we're gonna be starting an update to our climate, our energy and climate action plan, which will include both greenhouse gas emission reduction mitigation and climate adaptation pieces. So that will be interesting. Our current climate action plan only focuses on mitigation. And then finally, the Board of Supervisors directed the Community Services Department to embark upon a regional climate change coordination effort this past winter. So the Sustainability Initiatives Division is working collaboratively to understand regional needs and opportunities. And once that is once there's a bit more of a framework and a way forward, then members of the public and nonprofits will be invited as well, and there will be plenty of opportunities for input and participation in that down the road. So for more information, you can take a picture or come talk to me afterward. Um, please feel free to contact me if you'd like any, informa any information or have any questions, and I'm going to turn it over to Melissa to talk about the city now. Thank you. Thank you, Selena Evelsizer. Our next speaker, Melissa Hetrick, project planner at the City of Santa Barbara, has more than 17 years of experience in coastal planning, coastal and environmental permitting, and California Environmental Quality Act compliance. She is currently managing the city's sea level rise adaptation plan. Welcome. Good afternoon. So again, I'm Melissa Hetrick. I'm the uh, project manager for the City of Santa Barbara Sea Level Rise Adaptation Plan. Um, today, I'm just going to give a little bit of background about our plan, uh, go through the findings of our sea level rise vulnerability assessment, which was released in November of last year, and then talk about what the city's doing as far as next steps in adaptation planning. So just a little background. Um, you'll see in, in slides, in a slides, uh, few slides forward, that uh, sea, there actually hasn't been that much sea level rise occur in the Santa Barbara area to date. And so we get the question a lot of why are we planning for something that is going to be decades in the making now? And um, the answer is yes, we have some time until the effects of sea level rise become severe and sea levels um, rates increase significantly. But the eventual impacts are significant for our city and will, will require significant planning and funding. And I like to, as I like to say, we have the most options available to us now while the water is not, not right on top of us. Um, our project is funded through the California Coastal Commission as part of a, an update to our local coastal program that um, has been ongoing for about five years now, but we did just start the sea level rise planning portion of it about a year ago. 
So the, the city's sea level rise planning process has actually four steps. Um, the first was the release of a draft vulnerability assessment. And what this does, it gives the bad news. Um, it explains what will happen if we do nothing. And that was released in November um, of last year. And now we're in the process of um, identifying options for addressing the hazards that were identified in the vulnerability assessment. And those will be analyzed in depth in an adaptation plan, which we are um, going to be releasing at the end of summer for public review. Um, any policy direction that comes out of that adaptation plan will be packaged into a local coastal program amendment, which will then be considered by city council and the California Coastal Commission. So that's our plan. The eventual plan that we'll be releasing at the end of summer will have many components. It will include the results of the vulnerability assessment. For each adaptation strategy that we'll be looking at, we'll be looking at all kinds of factors. So feasibility, costs, the economic and fiscal impacts of the different strategies, environmental consequences, and other costs and benefits. The plan will identify triggers and thresholds to implement different strategies. It will also identify a, um, an, the um, ad additional monitoring and additional studies that need to be made in the future. Um, I like to take this, this opportunity to warn people <laughs> that our adaptation plan is not gonna answer all the, qu the questions. And, and in fact, it raises almost more questions than it answers. Um, it's really the purpose of it is to start to get a hold on what we're facing and different ways we can address it and to put forth a plan that's gonna be like a roadmap for when we have to make decisions by, what, what's involved in those decisions, what information do we need to make those decisions, and who do we need to get involved. So the adaptation plan process at the city involves, luckily, more than me. Um, there's an entire interdepartmental st staff team that's working on the project. Um, we have two main consultants on the project, Environmental Science Associates and AECOM. There's a sea level rise adaptation plan subcommittee that meets twice a month that is comprised of members of the City Council, the Harbor Commission, the Planning Commission, the Parks and Rec Commission, and then the Water Commission. Um, we're consulting with California Coastal Mission, the county, and other regional agencies. And then we're conducting public outreach events um, such as this. So I'm gonna give some of the results from our draft vulnerability assessment that was released in November. This is the bad news section. If <laughs> so again, this is, uh, the results I'm gonna give you is what happens if we do nothing, and I just want you to remember that. So um, luckily, the city was not tasked with deciding which um, levels of sea level rise to consider in our report. I'm very thankful for that. Um, <laughs> The state of California has that, done that for us. So the state of California has a state of California sea level rise guidance. They update it every, I think it's five years, maybe less. And what it does is gives uh, the projections for the upcoming years that cities and counties um, should use to plan for sea level rise. Um, and it gives different probabilities associated with different um, levels of sea level rise. Um, the, this graph shows the projections for sea level rise given in that report um, with the most probable um, levels of sea level rise in the orange on the, lower, on the lower bar, and then the least probable being the red bar. So what they're instructing cities and counties to do is look at something in the middle. Um, and that projection right now is for 0 0.75, 0 0.7 feet for 2030, 2.5 feet for 2060, and 6.6 .6 feet to, by 2100. And one thing I would just state is the projections, the timing of the projections is changing all the time. So, but if you, there is one thing when you look at the guidance and you look farther into the future, because they have data all the way moving forward, even if you look at the lowest projection, you eventually get to 6.6 .6 feet. It's just a matter of when that happens. 
So um, I imagine moving forward, you'll continue to hear that by 2060, different levels of sea level rise might happen. But I guess my message is, it's eventually going to happen. So there's no harm in, in planning. <laughs> So the vulnerability assessment looked at a number of types of hazards. Um, the top row represent permanent hazards. Uh, the first is shoreline erosion or beach erosion, and that's year-to-year -year erosion, not seasonal erosion. Bluff erosion, tidal inundation. Um, this term means the flooding that occurs on, based on regular high tides, not from storms, but just regular high tides. Um, and then we also looked at uh, storm waves and storm flooding during 100-year coastal storm events. And then we took a look at low-lying areas like the Castillo underpass that could get flooded because of um, rising groundwater levels. So these are what our maps look like. And actually, on our website, we have interactive maps. You can type in an address and look at the different hazards. This is 2030, this is the western side of the city. Um, it's almost entirely bluffs. You'll see the mesa um, in the center there. Um, the, the impacts for 2030, you'll, you'll see, you probably can't read it, but the orange and the yellow are bluff erosion. And this really is very close to our existing condition map. We already have bluff erosion on, the, on, on our mesa bluffs. But as we move into 2060 and 2100, the erosion begins to extend up to our major roads, so Shoreline Drive and Cliff Drive. It's projected that by 2060, um, the, cl the cliff erosion rate will increase by 40%, and by 2100, that the cliff erosion rate will increase by 140% from what we've seen in the past. Um, the other big story on this, side of the city is the beach loss. Um, the problem with the bluff area is that um, the bluffs will erode slower than sea levels will rise. And so it will essentially create a bathtub effect in the bluff back beaches, drowning out our bluff back beaches. So it's projected that by 2060, the city's western bluff side will lose 80% of its beaches and by 2100 that there will not be any um, passable area under the beaches in the bluff um, areas of the city. So this, moving to downtown and the waterfront, um, again, this is 2030. This is very close to our existing conditions. The green aqua color is tidal inundation. The um, darker blue color is flooding during coastal storms or 100-year storms. And the um, pink hatch is co uh, coastal erosion. So moving forward, by 2060, um, we see many of the public waterfront assets affected, like the public parks, public parking, um, some uh, inundation and storm surge hitting Cabrillo, the harbor affected, but really the impacts are largely contained to south of Cabrillo Boulevard. By 2100, it, it's a different story. So again, just to orient to um, on this map, the, the green color is tidal inundation, so regular inundation from high tides. Um, and the blue, the darker blue color, color is coastal storm flooding. So some of you might recognize this as our flooding area now. <laughs> so this area already floods in high rainfall intensity events now. The difference is um, in the area north of Highway 101, there'll be an increased frequency in flooding because those areas will be flooding not just from um, high rainfall events, but also high wave events. So storm, coastal storms or high wave events coming from the ocean. But the flood levels are projected to be at or below our existing base flood elevations and are, that have been mapped by FEMA. Um, south of the Highway 101, the flooding is, is uh, projected to be more extensive, much deeper, and much more frequent than we have now. And in fact, areas that 
only flood now during um, big storm events will in fact be flooding regularly on the high tide. So that's what that green area is. So um, I'm not going to get into all these asset categories, but that we took a look at a number of private and public assets affected. And I'm just going to quickly go through some of these because in the interest of time, if people have questions, um, feel free to ask. So as others have mentioned, transportation will be significantly impacted. I think I mentioned that Cabrillo and other surface streets and parking lots would be impacted by 2060. By 2100, there's tidal inundation at US 101 near Angela Clark Bird Refuge. The railroad experiences tidal inundation. Cabrillo Boulevard parking lots and then Shoreline and Cliff Drive are threatened by erosion. Um, I think I went into the, the beach impacts on the West Bluff side of the city. It's a, it's a better situation in the waterfront area because of the harbor configuration and also the fact that there's low-lying area behind the beaches. In those areas, it's projected that by 2060, 30% of the beaches will be lost, and then by 2100, that'd be 60%. It should it come as no surprise that Harbor and Stearns Wharf would experience some of the greatest impacts. Stearns Wharf is already um, vulnerable during high wave events. Um, that would only get worse. The harbor, without being raised, um, would experience difficulty in operations by 2060 and would be inoperable by 2100 without doing anything. Again, this is without doing anything. One of the biggest impacts that was identified in our plan was to our wastewater system. Um, as some of you may know, uh, the wastewater system in Santa Barbara is a gravity-fed system, so all the wastewater in the entire city <laughs> flows downhill into major pipes that are under the beach on the waterfront that then get piped up to El Listero Wastewater Treatment Plant, and that treats all the wastewater in the city. So that's a problem, given the sea level rise. Um, and so basically what we're looking at is as water, especially tidal inundation, starts to get into those lower lines, it basically pushes wastewater back up into people's homes, right? There's, it's a gravity-fed system. So, But in addition, essentially we all of a sudden have waste, the wastewater treatment plant treating seawater, which it's not designed to, be, to treat. So it's not that we can't move to like a New Orleans style system. There's plenty of other cities that have this problem. It's just not, we don't have the design of that system right now. So we're talking about some major changes to our wastewater system. And in addition, um, we also have the desalination plant that's located next to the Elastero wastewater treatment plant that would be impacted in 2100. So that's the bad news. Um, so we are in the process now of identifying various adaptation strategies for addressing these hazards. They generally fall into three major categories. Um, protection of development in place through measures such as seawalls, groins, tide gates, and beach nourishment and dunes. Uh, accommodation of development in place through measures such as elevation or modifications of structures and then retreat through measures such as relocation of structures and development limitations. And really in the end, um, I'm sure the city's path will be a hybrid of these strategies that will likely change over time as, as the conditions change. So again, this is our schedule. We'll be releasing a draft adaptation plan for public review in, in late summer of 2019. As part of that, we'll be conducting a number of public workshops um, and stakeholder events, and we will go from there. So the city has a website for the Seal of Arise Adaptation Plan. Again, it has the interactive maps I was telling you about. It has draft documents. There's a link to the Sea Level Rise subcommittee agendas and all the information associated with them. You can also sign up for notifications about the plan and the subcommittee meetings. And you're always welcome to call me if you have questions. Thank you.
Thank you, Melissa, and thanks to all our panelists. And now, uh, while we're collecting questions, uh, somebody's picking up index cards uh, in the audience. We're going to bring the questions forward. But while we're doing that, I'd like to invite the panelists to ask each other questions. Does any of you have a question for another panelist? Kathy? No? Oh, thanks. Um, I went to a conference last year where Mayor Garcetti from Los Angeles was a speaker, and one of the things he said that Los Angeles is doing proactively is having every department that reports to him, when they do a report, they have to include what they're doing on sustainability, whether it's the police department or the parks department or whoever, everybody has to be paying attention to this. And I just wondered if you are seeing that in, um, where, you know, when you're reporting upwards, if that's being requested of everybody. I can, I, can oh, go ahead. I can answer for the city that is now required on every council agenda report to report the sustainability impacts of right. that decision. Um, it's definitely, I know through the Seal of Arise subcommittee, there's a lot of interest floating up to council about Boarding. the issues of sustainability. Um, and at the county, we have a, a sustainability committee, and that committee is composed of the, uh, members from various different departments. And the um, that the community services department is responsible for kind of overseeing and managing operations of that committee, and they report to the board of supervisors annually. So just a quick follow-up, how, how does somebody get notifications about that committee or just to go online and, and check their agendas? Celine? Um, that committee is an internal county committee, but okay. um, the annual report uh, is would be just on the board's agenda, which is distributed publicly a couple weeks before the meetings. Thank yeah. you. Similarly, the city also has a sustainability committee. It's very similar, mm -hmm. but has regular meetings that are agendized on our website. Any other panelist questions for each other? Okay, I have a question uh, for any of you. Uh, obviously, what we can do as community members is to get engaged um, and to see what's happening and to learn about it. But what do you think the single most important thing community members can do in this process is? Those of us in this room. I mean, I think in addition to doing all the things we know we need to do um, is to talk about it. Have it be a topic of conversation. I know it's become politicized and that sometimes it feels uncomfortable because you feel like you're taking a political position, but as we've seen today and we know what's coming at us, this is not political. Um, and so talking about it, you know, raising it in conversation whenever you can, I think is extremely important. I would agree it's super important to talk about. I also think it's really important to talk about it to every candidate and every elected official. We are not going to solve this by having individuals take action in their own daily lives. That's important, but we need the systems transformations that are actually going to make a difference at scale, and we need them really fast. Um, so, you know, talk to the people that run your government and talk to the people that make decisions about what the policies are going to be and how quickly they're going to get enacted. And I completely agree with all of that. I would um, add also to stay optimistic that we can actually do this. And hearing about the co-benefits, you know, if we address climate change, we're also addressing these other issues, I think is something that keeps me motivated as well. So staying po positive and optimistic and believing that we can do this because we, we can. If we put our minds to it, we've done a lot of great things. 
Okay, we have some great questions from the audience. We'll try to get to as many of these as we can. For our city and, count and county planners, I recently went to a meeting on energy strategy and was struck that the focus area for testing new strategies is within the Lower East Side, an area that already has flooding. How will climate change and planners coordinate with energy planners? Sea level rise planners coordinate with energy planners. Um, from the city's perspective, we are coordinating. Um, we have taken a look at the location of those projects, and um, those areas already do flood from rainfall events, and the, um, the buildings and infrastructure there is, is built above the base flood ele elevation. And we will see an increase in frequency in flooding in those areas, but not, um, you also have to think about the timing of things. A lot of this stuff is not coming for several years. And so there will be a phasing of implementation. Yeah. Well, we have a couple of questions about the wastewater treatment plan. Um, so I th I'm gonna pass these to you, Melissa. Um, one was, should the city immediately start building a new plant somewhere else? Um, and the other question was, what could be done in the near term? So in the near term, we've actually already started uh, lining our main wastewater lines so that water can't get in from the outside um, and taking measures like that to make them more resilient. You know, the, the fixes for the wastewater system really depend on the nature of the development that they serve and what's going on in those areas. Um, so it won't work to move the wastewater treatment plant super far inland if we're still serving a development area that goes all the way down to the ocean. Um, also, uh, the wastewater treatment plant is actually um, on a fairly high piece of ground. You'd be surprised down there. <laughs> so it's really more of a system problem that we need to look at, and it's gonna require replacing lines over time. Um, and it will also be dependent, though, on what strategies we pick to address the problems um, associated with the development south of 101. Whatever is chosen for that area will drive what we do with the wastewater system. Can I ask a question? Yes. So I'm, I'm curious um, to what extent the problem with the wastewater treatment system is in part dependent on how much wastewater there is, because one of the, you know, one of the big questions I think we have to confront is just how we use our resources. And right now, you know, we take a lot of gray water, water that could be used for, um, that could be safely reused in many applications, if not for, not for drinking, obviously. Would that make a difference to just reduce the overall amount of water that's flowing into the system? You know, I do not have, the, I don't have the answer to that question. Um, I know that our wastewater people are continually looking at recycled water options. In fact, we have a recycled water plant that is co-located with um, the wastewater treatment plant, but also looking at things like drug potable and things like that in the future. Um, my knowledge on that issue is, is related to the sea level rise, so I'm not sure. Okay, well, it's good we got into resources because this is a very simple, very basic question from the audience. How will the changes we need to make be paid for? <laughs> <laughs> I know, this is a I, I hard think, question. <laughs> yeah, it's a hard question, and I think what we also have to think about side by side is what will the costs be if we don't make the changes? So we know that in terms of like a transition to 100% safe renewable energy, we have the technology, the cost has been coming down very fast. And if we don't make the cost, if we keep burning fossil fuels and, and even worse, expanding our fossil fuel infrastructure, which is on the table here in the county, we're literally dooming our, our children to catastrophic impacts with no way out. What's the cost of that? Um, so, you know, we have to, in my opinion, we have to really not, not think only of the costs, but we have to think about um, 
why the costs are worth it um, and, and what it means to not make those investments, many of which, you know, it's, it's cheaper now to build new renewable than to build new power, new fossil fuel power plants. Um, it's cheaper to walk and bike than it is to drive a car around. So there are costs, and as I mentioned, there's a lot of benefits, and if we really did a cost accounting that took into account the full costs and the full benefits, the cost side might look a lot different. Also say for sea level rise, at least in the city, we do have some time, and that's what I was getting at as far as planning. That if we started now, um, thinking about costs and funding, um, it will be will be a whole lot better off than if we wait. Um, and it, in addition, I'd like to reiterate that when having looked at the beginning numbers of our economic and fiscal impact study, the cost of doing nothing is much higher than doing adaptation strategies, so, um, and especially climate mitigation that can slow down the effects of sea level rise and other things. So I have a question for Kathy um, from the audience, and I'm going to expand it a little bit broader than the question, but here's the question. If you had to give Santa Barbara a grade overall for its climate resilience, what grade would you give? Now, Let's expand that to say, what are the biggest challenges and where are we as, other, as compared with other communities? Who can you think of um, that we're doing better than or worse than? Gosh, that's a Sigrid question more than a question for me because that's what she's been focusing on. Um, you know, I think we're doing fairly well, but I think that our mindset here as the birth of environmentalism is it sort of clouds that because it makes us feel like we're doing better than we are. You know, the wheels of bureaucracy here turn just as slowly as they turn in other places, and we do need to speed that up, and, um, you know, engagement by us is what's going to help that. Um, I, I don't know if I can give a grade. I mean, I know that we have someone here from the Bay Area, and I always feel like they are ahead of us um, in, in every way on this, and I always look to them for... Um, innovation and leadership and, and things that we can do the same way that they're doing it. So maybe she has an answer about us or for what's happening in the Bay Area. I don't have um, a lot of deep, I don't, I don't know all that's going on down here, so I don't really feel confident in answering the question. But I'll say one thing I'm certain of, you're not doing enough to stop driving. Vehicle miles traveled, you gotta cut down on the number of vehicle miles traveled per capita. And again, that's going to require some investment in um, bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure and in a real public transit system that serves all of the county um, affordably. And <laughs> transportation now accounts for about 40% of emissions in California. And that's, and you know, California's done a lot. California's on the leading edge in the, in the whole country and, and, and for many parts of the world um, in terms of what it has been able to achieve. But the big blind spot in California is that vehicle miles traveled are going up. And even if we're able to shift to, to electric vehicles, we're, we can't do that fast enough. And it takes a lot of power and a lot of energy to build a new vehicle. So we've got to address that issue, and it's an issue that largely has to be addressed at the local level. Okay, now another question for you, Dr. Rudolph. What land use policies do you see as being important in addressing climate change impacts on public health? And I, I guess I would add to that, other than transportation and, and, and transit systems, but uh, especially in Santa Barbara, which is largely built out. Um, the issues of land use, transportation, and housing are all really inter intermingled. And you have a big affordability problem here, and that's in large part driving some of the increase in vehicle miles traveled. So you're not built out. You're sprawled out, um, and if you drive, I just drove down here from the Bay Area, um, you're, you're producing more and more sprawl. 
in North County. So I think the biggest land use issue that, it, that really is, how do you create livable, affordable communities that put people near their jobs and the essentials that they need, grocery stores, parks, which we don't want to leave out of the equation, and transit so that you can accommodate the people that work here without driving long distances to get to work. And it may mean that your county can't all be low rise. Um, so I, I would say that's one of the, you know, a, a big land use issue that has to be addressed as you develop, not to let sprawl increase. Yeah. So this is a related question in, in terms of um, low cost housing and the need to have more of it in, in our community. Um, but where do you put it? Because um, the land is, is cheaper near the freeways where there's a lot of pollution and bad air quality just coming off the freeway. And then also um, wherever you put it, you have to think about sea level rise. So that is um, kind of just a general planner's question and also for you, Linda. I'm going to defer to the planners and then maybe I'll comment after on the air quality issues. There in the unincorporated county areas, there are there are opportunities. There still is some vacant land that is in um, community plan areas that's designated for mixed use development or designated for more uh, more dense community development. So there, there definitely are opportunities now, and I agree that it's something that we'll continue to need to, to uh, be examined to look for more opportunities that are close to existing facilities, and but continue to give people housing options going forward. The housing near, near busy roadways is a real issue. We do know that people that live near busy roadways do have higher rates of um, asthma and other respiratory disease. And um, as I mentioned, children are particularly vulnerable. However, there are things that you can do in housing. San Francisco, for example, has an ordinance that allows new housing uh, or high-rise housing near um, freeways, um, which are you know probably busier than most of the freeways here, um, but that require additional levels of um, ventilation and air filtration equipment, some monitoring, and also there's things that you can do in terms of site design that limit the exposure. Um, the state has spent a lot of time looking at this issue of housing infill and um, and air quality, and I believe has some guidelines that are in the works on how to address that. Um, but it's a tangled issue. Yeah, it's very complicated. You, you work on addressing one thing and then something else. Um, now, in terms of thinking about adaptation strategies, we had a couple of questions on specific strategies, like um, what about policies on reclaimed water are they being looked at at the city or the county um, to make more water available um, for gardening, landscaping that isn't necessarily uh, drinking water? And another question about rain barrels, which is if you're encouraging people to store water, um, that is a big problem for the mosquito side of things. So how do you, how do you think about these things? Are you able to, to look at adaptation strategies and then think through some of the unintended consequences? Um, I'll, uh, I'll take a shot at that. First of all, there's lots of ways to create rain barrels um, and recapture rainwater that don't that that include proper um, netting and you know so on to keep them from being um, vec uh, habitat for mosquitoes. Um, so that's not an issue if it's done right. Um, so there needs to be a system to make sure that people do it right. Other counties are really looking at the use of, uh, at reclaiming all, um, as much water as they can. Orange County has one of the most um, advanced, um, they don't call it this, I can't remember what they call it, but I call it toilet to tap. Um, but 
Um, yeah, so there's a lot of work going on in that area. I don't know what's happening in Santa Barbara, but again, you know, we're, we're not gonna have enough water in California for using the way we currently do, and we really have to look at all of the alternatives um, for that. Um, you have a great environmental health program here in the Department of, of um, Public Health, and uh, the director of that program, Larry Fay, is um, well-versed in all of these issues where that nexus um, with public health comes in. Well, it's good you brought that up because we did have a question about where, where does the leadership in the county as a whole come from and where, who, who will head this up on a county level um, because it seems like there's pieces, there's municipalities doing planning efforts, there's unincorporated county planning, um, and then there's your, your sustainable community, uh, committees. But how do we get everybody together, public health, mental health, you know, all of these different things on the same page? Any, any of you, take that one. <laughs> uh, that's definitely been a recurring question <laughs> over and over recently, and there are some activities going on to start to have that kind of regional collaboration, a regional forum, like an established entity, a regional entity for Santa Barbara County where um, we can focus on these topics and um, look at regional solutions in, and go in together to you know, request funding from the state or other agencies you know, for our region and um, kind of lean on each other and so I, there's definitely a need and there's a lot of chatter but um, and there there are some efforts but yeah definitely um, that's something that more momentum on is needed in the future yeah it's a challenge and and dr. Rudolph I wanted to ask you too um, in terms of what Melissa said about we have some time to think about sea level rise. Would you agree we have time to think about some of these health impacts? Well, we're already seeing health impacts. And, the, you know, it's not as though the health impacts we're seeing are new. We're not seeing new diseases. We're seeing an exacerbation and an increase in the diseases that we already have that are the diseases that are driving for health outcomes and health inequities. So, you know, that, that's, that's really the most important message. These actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and, and some of the actions to adapt to rising temperatures, for example, with parks and tree canopy. Um, but, but active transportation, better food systems, healthier, more affordable, healthy foods, reducing meat consumption, um, you know, clean energy. These are things that are gonna yield health benefits as soon as we implement them because they address our existing health challenges, which are all being exacerbated by climate change. That's why people call climate change a threat multiplier. So I feel like not only do we need sustainability in all policies, we need health and equity in all policies so that as we're developing our climate actions, we're taking into account these health benefits, and we're thinking about how to make sure that we're redressing social and, and health inequities in our community so that everyone can be healthy. Um, you know, there's only one health department in the county. You don't have city health departments. Unfortunately, right now, the health department, there's no grants like there is from the Coastal Commission to county health departments to do this work with communities, which makes it harder for the health department to engage in these conversations with the other city and county health departments about how to really um, put health into the mix. So, um, and that would be one thing that would be really helpful would just be to, you know, provide a little kickstart of resources for the health department to really engage in this conversation and help people understand how our current health is in fact very much impacted by what we do in terms of climate action. 
And I did get a question for you, Dr. Rudolph. Um, recent research shows that increased heat and decreased rainfall can actually have a negative effect on educational attainment in children. Um, how long do you think before we see this come to our, our area of the world? I'm not familiar with that, so whoever put that question in should come tell me where to find that study or studies. Um, I mean, heat does, pro heat, I know, there's a lot of studies showing that heat reduces cognitive performance. Also, heat has a huge impact on labor productivity. So it will make, you know, it's very hard for people to work outdoors on really hot days for a long time without significant declines in productivity. And there's, there's lots of studies showing that in parts of the world, um, people aren't going to be able to work outdoors for much of the summer months with huge impacts on food production. Um, but I haven't, I haven't seen that, that information in terms of um, the educational impacts. Okay, um, one question, maybe Selena, you could take this, um, about the Gaviota Coast um, and sea level rise. Um, is it going to be possible to protect the coast from further development given the threat of sea level rise? Um, is that something that can, could occur um, in terms of planned developments? Uh, yeah, the Gaviota Coast Plan was just uh, ad just certified this past year, and it went through a really extensive public participation process. Um, and so, it the participants and the county board and everyone involved really considered very carefully future development in the Gaviota Coast area. There definitely will be sea level rise impacts to the the bluffs, bluff erosion loss of beaches, impacts to the state parks, um, impacts to the railroad and Highway 101 in that area. So there definitely are impacts that need that will have to be considered as we go forward for that area. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to give each of you a chance to either answer a question that wasn't asked, um, but you think is really an important question, or to ask your own question of, of what, where we can go in the future or to talk a little bit about what the biggest challenges we are facing in terms of getting any of this done and prepared and worked on. So start with you, Melissa, and we'll come back up here. Let's see. Um, I would say the biggest, there's two biggest problems that I'm at least facing in my planning, and it really gets to the issue that we've all been talking about is just the way that we are structured right now and our laws and the way that we have structured all of our organizations really didn't anticipate this. And so, <laughs> and so there's definitely quite a bit of work to do to um, restructure and devote resources. Because for instance, we were just laughing, like, this is only like 30% of my job. You know, <laughs> like I'm the only person working. So yeah, so, some of the things that will be coming out of the sea level rise adaptation plan are recommendations for things like restructuring and we need to start funding this. We can't just, you know. So I think that that's actually our first step that needs to happen soon. Um, I think just thinking solely about the county's coastal resiliency project, one um, concern that we had that we saw as we went through and was that we we really tried to you know create different public um, involvement opportunities workshops meetings we even went out to the beach on coastal cleanup day to talk to people um, and we know there's so much interest but I think like Dr. Rudolph was saying communicating that to your local agency and um, elected officials and other other community members, I think, um, would be really helpful and help local agencies start to address the problem of you know allocating resources appropriately and things like that. Thank you. Uh, I think that the biggest challenge is urgency. Th this we are really facing a, a health emergency, but it's an emergency in many other ways too. And I don't see any of the trappings of an emergency. So 
I think that communicating to policymakers at all levels of government that we're confronting an emergency and we need to act as such is the biggest challenge. And that's really going to take, you know, the kids that are out on Fridays and all the people in this room and all the people that you go out and talk to about it saying this, we care deeply about this. It is about our health now and the, literally the future of our children and grandchildren. And we can't just conduct business as usual. We've got to get it together to um, act with ur the urgency that the situation demands. Well, I couldn't agree with that more. Um, having worked on this issue in the nonprofit sector here for almost a dozen years, um, you know, when I first would go to an event where there'd be multiple different categories of nonprofits, environment and animals would be over there. So, you know, we'd be sitting there with the, you know, dog or whoever doing great work going, what do we have in common? But that's, that's how we've been marginalized and compartmentalized for a long time. And I think that really we have such an incredible thriving nonprofit sector in Santa Barbara and that there's so much opportunity for all of these other great organizations, including an international relief organization that's based here, to start talking about this in relation to the work that they do. I'm not saying they have to work on it, but, but it needs to be infused more deeply into the work that everyone is doing into education. I mean, I think kids are starting to talk about it and there's, there's this movement of, of young people that are saying, we need a World War II style mobilization effort, but I don't hear them talking about sacrifice. And clearly, this is going to require some sacrifice. And, and the longer we put it off, the more pain we're going to feel. So if we can start just in our daily decisions, every single time we pull out our wallet, we are making decisions that affect, that, that have an effect on this, right? The things that we buy, the places we go, how much we drive, the things that we do. So if we can all start really seeing this as something urgent, then, and, and then encouraging our our political system to also reflect that, then that's where we can start making some progress quickly. I think it's really important for all of us to continue this conversation. This is, this is a conversation we need to have. We need to have all these discussions about rain barrels and treatment plants and mosquitoes and health impacts, we need to have the, the social equity, the social injustices, we need to be looking at those. In this context, I think we all need to keep the conversation going and attend those hearings, advocate for those dollars, all of the things that need to happen, we need to get going and roll up our sleeves. So thank you all for coming.